You're listening to The Great Simplification with Nate Hagens. That's me. On this show, we try to explore and simplify what's happening with energy, the economy, the environment, and our society. Together with scientists, experts, and leaders, this show is about understanding the bird's eye view of how everything fits together, where we go from here, and what we can do about it as a society and as individuals. Today, I am pleased to introduce Ayan Mahamud. Ayan coordinates regional programming tasks within the Initiative on Drought Resilience, which covers seven countries in the Horn of Africa. She currently manages the USAID program portfolio at the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, working on issues related to resilience, climate adaptation, dry land development, cross-border health, countering violent extremism, and conflict prevention. But on today's episode, I talk with Ayan not in her professional capacity, but as a friend and as a citizen of Africa and of the world. We discuss the growing challenge that climate change faces for Africa and many areas in the global south, and how what we call the poly crisis is already happening around the world. In many ways, the discussions in our culture are not only energy blind, but also people outside our country blind. What has managing and coordinating poly crisis responses in Africa looked like? What can we learn from communities already dealing with poverty and climate impacts? I hope you learn and are inspired by this conversation with Ayan Mahamud. Salam alaikum, Ayan. Alaikum salam, my friend. How are you? I am good. Good to see you. Good to see you in person uh, six weeks ago or so. Yes, absolutely. It was a uh, that was a good bubble. That was really a, a good time. So, for people that uh, don't know of you and your work, could you just start this conversation by saying well, your name, where do you live, what do you do, and maybe you know how how we came together to to be friends. Well, my name is Ayan Mahamud. I live in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, and I work with the Regional Economic Community. It's a REC called IGAT. And I work on um, regional transboundary crisis, polycrisis, and that's how we, we became friends. We were debating between polycrisis and collapse. That's a wonderful one of the discussion we had when we uh, we met a few weeks ago. So my hope with this conversation is to kind of take our professional hats off and just talk to each other about citizens being as citizens of the world living in vastly different places and being alive at this time facing what we do with the economic energy climate biodiversity situation and you're the first person I've had from Africa or the global South generally. And I really would love to get some honest, deep uh, perspectives from you. And uh, I I would love you to do most of of the talking. So maybe before we dive into that, can you tell us what the situation is on the Horn of Africa right now in Eastern Africa, where, where you live? Just broadly. Broadly, let me start by saying that the region is currently facing its fifth failed rainy season. And, and there are not many rainy season in a 12-month period, for example. There are only two short rains and long rains. Uh, um, and on a yearly basis, we're talking about either March, April, May, or October, November, December, for example. And right now, we, as I said, we are, we, we are facing, the region is facing its fifth failed rainy season. The first one was announced in the midst of... Uh, of COVID in August 2020 and of course because of COVID it went it almost went un- unnoticed because the community dived into their economies and, and resources and, and, and the small resilience program that we, we've been implementing since the, the previous major drought of 2010 and 2011 uh, and the adaptive cap- capacities that they had thanks to those, those uh, resilience programs. So right now the re- region is facing a major drought and uh, desertification is a reality to which mo- 
the state must adapt with a clear, clear indication that they will be more frequent and more intense with climate change. In fact, in um, in Eastern Africa, uh, in countries like Somalia, Ethiopia, and Kenya, which are uh, particularly affected by shortage of, of water, uh, food, and food, as, as I speak to you, according to the latest uh, uh, assessment, we're talking about more than 25 million people in acute, acute food insecurity. Uh, and 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 uh, we're also talking about millions of of people that have been forced to leave their homes for lack of, of food, and over uh, seven millions of head of cattle and livestock that have already perished. So it's a it's a crisis. We are in the middle of a crisis, but uh, it's not the only one. That's that's what we are facing in, in the region. Yeah. Well, we were just at a conference that the title of it was called the poly crisis because there's so many different interconnected aspects of of this. For instance, what's happening in Russia and Ukraine is raising energy and fertilizer and food prices around the world. So I assume that is also having an impact on top of the the, um, lack of, of rain that you mentioned. Absolutely, Nate. The price of, of commodities such as uh, maize, uh, sunflower, in addition to food and fertilizers, have, have really skyrocketed. And right now, in addition to, to the drought that I was just mentioning, it's it, a, a whole food crisis. And at this point, I don't think it's only East Africa, but I think we are facing it at a, at a global level, isn't it? Uh, we were happy to hear that the first ship of grain left uh, Turkey when we were in, in the conference together, is that, wasn't it? Or was it prior to that? I can't remember. Thanks to Turkey who negotiated that within the UN framework. So yeah, the global crisis that is brought by the Ukraine and, and, and Russian war definitely has a repercussion in the price of commodities in, in Eastern Africa. So in Eastern Africa, and when I say Eastern Africa, that includes which countries? Somalia, Kenya, Uganda, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Eritrea, what else? Uh, Sudan and South Sudan. We are uh, okay. uh, eight countries that are members of the IGAD region, yes. And to my knowledge, that is roughly 400, 500 million people live in those countries? We are talking about 270 million, I think, the last prediction, yeah. A little over, 270 million. Yeah. So roughly the size of the United States and population wise, yes. give or take. Yeah. So how much food in that region is generally grown or produced within the borders of those eight countries and how much is imported? It's very hard to quantify in the sense that there's, a, there's an informal trade that also comes into and, and rarely gets captured in, in the food trade figures. But for instance, in a, in a country like Kenya, Kenya imports almost half of, uh, of its grain consumption. It produces, yes, but it exports as much as it is imports from Tanzania, from Uganda, much like the milk production, for example. I mean, there's a fair share that comes from, from the other countries in the region. So when those who produce are, are not producing enough, even for their own consumption, they tend to, to reduce the parts that get exported and shared with the other countries. And definitely the prices reflect that currently in, uh, in the Horn of Africa. I mean, one kg of maize, which is the the, the staple here in uh, in Kenya, was maize flour is going for a dollar, for example. But now it's more than double. It's two point five dollars the kg of, uh, of 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 maize flour. Not the common person. Not every, the, you'd say the average Joe. He would say the average uh, John. Uh, <laughs> I can't afford it. <laughs> so how do you factor this in to your climate resilience? modeling for coming decades. I imagine you have models that look at how droughts and floods might impact things or maybe even higher temperatures, but it's hard to model geopolitical impacts on energy and ammonia fertilizer and food as well. Mm -hmm. But like what sort of scenarios do you talk about with your colleagues or think about with respect to the changing climate and the changing geopolitical commodity landscape in coming decades? That's a good question. I feel we 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 remain stuck in the in the usual way of doing things when we're doing climate projection, for example, where we have we don't take into consideration some key geopolitical factors. Just like I mean, the current situation is is an example of that. We 
tend to remain is strategic planning and forget that we, we also probably would require a little bit of foresight and develop different types of scenarios. It's gaining a momentum within the region, for example, when we are developing the the next phase of the planning, as in we, we project ourselves by 2032, for example, what would be the situation, what would be a regional situation, the global, analyze the current uh, trends. Uh, relationship between Russia and the rest of the world, relationship between China, US. So uh, it's something that is that is slowly picking up, but there's no study or discussion paper that have been produced specifically for uh, resilience programming. Now, what we generally and what we commit ourselves to do is, for example, when we are planning for uh, resilience programming within the region, we don't only look into water resources uh, uh, for example, we we also link it with some uh, rangeland development. We link it with some uh, alternative uh, livelihood uh, development. We link it with income generating activities. We make sure that there's a little bit of peace, not a little bit, a lot of peace, and reducing the conflict within the community, within the region. So we're trying to be as holistic as possible. But definitely the strategy and the program that we have developed for the past what, 15 years didn't take into consideration the, the current. Of course, that took almost everybody by surprise. So other than the drought, which you mentioned, are there other noticeable current impacts from climate change in Eastern Africa that you're observing? The drought is the biggest impact of uh, climate change in the area where I work, as in pastoral and, and agro-pastoral area, arid and semi-arid land, which are already scarce in terms of resources. But of course, definitely, we also have uh, the other aspect of it, which is excess of water, and that's floods. Didn't you tell me that there was a problem with nighttime temperature for animals or something like that? Extreme temperatures, yes, definitely. That, well, you have a very good memory. Yes, the heat waves uh, that Europe faced over, over the summer. We, well, that was our winter season. And in areas within within the Horn of Africa where, of course, we have winters, we, we sometimes end up with temperature below 50, not minus 50 uh, Fahrenheit, but below 50 Fahrenheit, which would equivalent to 10 degrees Celsius, 5 to 10 degrees Celsius. And yes, of course, that is uh, the livestock and, and, and livestock heads are also highly sensitive to uh, extreme temperatures, whether heat or, or cold, yeah. Well, that was what got us started talking in, in uh, Denmark is I asked a perspective from the global north when you said, oh, yeah, the extreme temperatures are really affecting the animals. And I was thinking like elephants and giraffes, but you were talking about <laughs> livestock and, and cows. Is that modeled? <laughs> Like the wet bulb temperature for humans, I know, has been modeled. But in your work, do you look at increasing temperature stress on livestock in coming decades where the nights won't get cool enough for um, effective respiration and rest for animals? Or is that kind of arcane and obscure? No, no, you're absolutely correct. This it has been modeled. Um, the effect of the impact of climate change, generally speaking, it could be a, a flood, a extreme temperature, any any extreme climate event, has been modeled. And 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 yes, definitely, it has an impact on the livestock body condition, for example, on on the livestock health, and it trickles down into into the resources of the community. For example, if the cattle is weak. It, they don't get the expected price. You see, it's, it, they, they sell it at a loss or something if they ever sell it. So no, it, the models are there. The impact of climate change, generally speaking, on livestock has been studied. Uh, the last study I remember was back in, I think, 2017 from some team that we were working with in the, in the region. So vector borne diseases. Right now, we're even mapping the tsetse fly. The one we thought we thought it was eradicated, but somehow it's uh, uh, re-emerging. Uh, we've had uh, a desert locust invasion back in 2019, just prior to COVID. So when COVID hit the region for us, we were uh, barely recovering from uh, a previous drought, 2016, 2017, followed by uh, a desert locust in 20 uh, invasion in 2019 and 2020, and then COVID hit, and then and then the border got closed and then less less uh, transboundary uh, trade because, I mean, people in the communities, in the cross-border community, rely more on, on trade across the border than anywhere else. So, yes, when uh, I remember we had a conversation on polycrisis versus collapse that uh, I hope uh, another perspective of the global south. Well, I think when people say 
are we going to have collapse? When is collapse going to happen? They're really talking about when is collapse going to happen to me? Because collapse has already happened to Ukraine and to Syria and to uh, whale populations and insects mm -hmm. and, and different communities around the world. So um, I forgot who said this quote, but the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed, which is one reason I really was keen to talk to you because mm -hmm. we so rarely think about what the impacts of the great simplification or a reduction in global GDP combined with generally warmer temperatures and extreme weather events have outside of Europe in the United States, which is uh, where many of my listeners of this show are. We don't see on the news what's happening in Africa right now. We did see the floods in Pakistan, mm. but I don't think anyone has much of an idea that they're are 300 million people living in the countries around you that are really struggling right now before climate really gets worse. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think you're actually right when you, when you put this in perspective and, and when we, we come to think about it, there are many different societies, living hu human, non-human, who have faced collapse before we met. And I think I was talking to a common friend earlier last month when I was reflecting on, we say uh, for us specifically in the Horn, it's, it's a fifth failed rainy season. But as you mentioned, I didn't see any any major piece on uh, news in, in any or Global North news outlets, for example. Some of the things that I was very frustrated with is the very little attention that it, the, the, the situation got. Uh, and, I, and I realized well, I wasn't the only one because I saw two articles that were published afterwards uh, as, as I started digging into it. And they were saying globally mainly the same thing. That is, uh, how is it that this situation has not gotten the, the attention that it would have gotten before? I remember the 2010, 2011. And in magnitude, for example, compared to that previous previous drought, it's, it's a study that we're actually carrying out now, trying to compare what makes this drought different, and is there anything that we can do about it? Uh, trying to mapping just the drought hotspot is just one thing, but trying to better understand what is it that we are not able to do or, or what are we missing. So basically, yes, we were wondering how is it that it, it, it has not captured the attention of the rest of the globe. And and, and that's why it, it it struck me, it struck me is that uh, maybe the, the humanitarian community itself is collapsing in the sense that the need and the level of the magnitude of crisis at global level, it's so immense that things fall into the crack and this get now pushed into a, a second or a hoping that somebody else will, will pick it up. Well, I think underpinning that is as the crises accelerate, the focus is gradually but inexorably going to be more and more local for the Japan and Germany and eventually the United States. Partially <laughs> ripping on my own country or the education system here. I think one of the reasons <clears throat> to describe the lack of attention is uh, I think 30% of Americans or something like that think Africa is a country. And ripping on my own self, uh, when you told me when we met that you lived in the Horn of Africa, I didn't know what that was. And I've been to Africa three times. So I, I switched my globe around today. The Horn of Africa is the Horn here, which is exactly the, uh, the Eastern countries that you reference. And you're from Djibouti, right? Yes, I am. So what do, I guess this would be a two-part question. Obviously, the people you work with understand climate and envision future scenarios, but what do the average people in Kenya and Uganda think about, or what is their response when you blink, bring up global warming or climate change? Do you know, it's funny. I generally don't think they think about climate change. I think they see this as, as these buzzwords that get coverage, coverage and, ex and I don't think they link it with someone. For example, I was talking to uh, uh, a colleague of mine whose wife produces uh, as a bee, uh, what's called apiculture. Yeah. She has a, a, a bee farm and she produces honey. So I asked him, how was the honey production, for example, compared to before? He says, oh, yeah, now it has reduced. We had to increase the prices. So I asked him, and what brought that change? He says, oh, you know, it's uh, pollution, degradation. But never had he brought the word climate change into that mix. As in, it's the fact that the, the trees are disappearing. Yes. The fact that pollution is there. Yes. But climate change, for most people in, in the home 
it appears like this this buzzword that has been confirmed by another and she she's uh it's it's a friend and a colleague and 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 she's educated so i asked her what do you think of climate change and and as as we were preparing for the podcast and she tells me people should stop talking about it and start doing something about it so i asked her, what does she think we should be doing she said yeah well let's just plant more trees and you know and then after that we will take care uh, of of uh, and, and try to manage the waste so that our rivers don't get polluted so and maybe it's 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 upon us because i don't know we we were too scientific when we were trying to to explain that to the common people maybe we we should have broken it down into more Here's a thought, and I'm not an expert on this, uh, which is why I'm so glad to be talking with you. There's a growing climate justice conversation, which is that the global north burned 90% of the fossil carbon and hydrocarbons that are resulting in climate change. But predominantly the impacts, certainly in the near term and very likely in the longer term, will be disproportionately felt on the global south, which has less economic and energetic means with which to adapt. Mm -hmm. But I never thought about the fact that that climate justice conversation is probably being held among elites and scientists and such. And the general public in those countries may not be fluent in the climate scenarios or or even the logic of it. What do you think about that? I think I, 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 I tend to concur with you. I think there's a local definition of climate justice that for us in Africa would probably be more linked to environmental justice, for example, whereby that entails uh, the right to, um, to have access, to use and to control mostly natural resources by the communities that share the land. So that was, that's, I think, a more localized, a contextualized definition of climate justice. And and I and I recall a case back in 2003 where a, a local community in Kenya uh, was uh, uh, even brought a case against the government of Kenya to the uh, African Commission on uh, on Human Rights, uh, Human and People Rights, and the commission found Kenya to be in violation of the of the Charter, the African Charter, and that the community was displaced from their ancestral land without any prior consultation or any any uh, adequate or effective compensation for for the loss of the property the disruption the loss of resources the community you know these, these are we're talking about pastoral communities yeah there was even an aspect of uh, of of the right to practice their religion and their culture culture and etc so w- when when we talk about climate in an african context most often than not it it has uh, an environmental aspect to it more than uh, so so definitely you know when we are we're trying to explain some of those big notions like uh, I also recall at some point the ozone layer I'm, I'm a child of the 80s so uh, mid 90s and the Rio I remember that huge fear we had that the ozone layer was disappearing and we're all gonna die and I don't know do you know if it was ever fixed the ozone layer? Yes. It, well, it, it was, but there's worries about it having a resurgence of risk. But what ended up happening is that was one of the environmental stories where we had a smoking gun. We could see what was happening and there was an easy economic fix, which was to change the um, the chlorofluorocarbons in the yeah. spray bottles and things like that. Yes. So, yeah, it did. It did heal. Yeah. So did you did you start as a teenager in Djibouti caring about the environment have you, have you long cared about the non-human sphere I was uh, a witness to the effect of climate change, definitely, because we see, again, when you, we're talking about pastoral communities, I, I'm, I'm third generation of pastoralists. Uh, uh, my grandfather uh, used to, to come in period of drought, so whenever he would come and say, yeah, it's a major drought, you have lost so much, so many different numbers of, 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 of cattle and goats and sheep and etc. So that always resonates, the, uh, the work. I honestly have no idea whether that was what brought me to working on on, on drought and 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 community resilience but i don't know maybe subconsciously <laughs> it contributed to uh it's some of those things that i i was very much sensitive to uh and this was very scary back in the 90s when we were told no 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 the ozone layer is going to uh, it's going to be hotter and hotter and imagine djibouti we're already at 54 degrees celsius how are places like djibouti going to manage hotter temperatures in coming decades what i can't imagine too many i mean how many people have air conditioning 
which itself generates more fossil emissions, of course. Mm. In Djibouti, in Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East, uh, it's hard to even speculate. What are your thoughts on that? You see, the gap is widening in Djibouti specifically. I mean, at least the Middle East, they can afford it. Yeah, They, uh, they have the until fossil fluid just just disappears but but they they have the the resources to cater for for the need energy need in Djibouti it's a whole different story because i mean we are uh, less than a million uh, uh, inhabitant population and 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 75% of us live in the capital city and out of that i think we are probably you see that pareto law where we have 40% that have 80% of the resources and, and vice versa. So there is a, the, the gap is widening between the middle class and those who can afford. And electricity is a luxury, to be, to be honest. I don't, it is very scary. I, I will invite you to come visit Djibouti, especially in the summer. Especially in the summer? <laughs> yes, but you are my friend. So in the summer, <laughs> August. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do well with heat. It's yeah. hard for me to imagine 54 Celsius. Uh, I'm, that would probably be a death sentence for me unless I was air conditioned. I, I don't know how to think about these things. I mean, you're a professional. Your work is on climate adaptation. And do you have models looking at the hotter parts of Africa in coming decades? And do you make recommendations on on that trajectory, because it would seem to me that if there is a um, economically disadvantaged population that can't have electricity or air mm. conditioning, that the wet bulb temperature will get to points where it could be potentially fatal for more humans in coming decades. Yes, we do have studies. Just to answer that, uh, uh, we have studies, and we are we are actually commissioning some more studies that goes into analyzing the extreme temperature and the effect on. Uh, I'm sure some have already been done on economy uh, 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 and on human population specifically. That I'm sure it has been done, but you're trying to to undertake our own part of the analyzing what trick the trigger and threshold whereby it becomes unsustainable and 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 what action. We spoke earlier about scenarios and scenario planning. These are some of the things that we we are hoping to achieve. But you see, this is uh, this is another gap that I, I notice, and I'm not the only one. I also saw that earlier this week, when John Kerry was in a, at a conference, the U.S. Envoy for Climate Change, as a conference in I think it was in Senegal, the, and the network of African negotiators were not really happy about some of his his discourses, and 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 they 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 for once. And I think it has a little something to do with the upcoming COP27, which will be now in Africa, in Egypt. Among the scientists in Africa, we are calling more and more for uh, African voice to be heard. It, this, for example, this 1.5 degree that is 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 being uh, uh, analyzed and, and scenarios being built around in in the IPCC. We have already passed that in in, in Djibouti. I think we had a 1.7 in degree increase between uh, 1980s and, and, and I think 2017, we were already by then at 1.7 degrees Celsius increase. So a little bit more inclusivity. And maybe that's that's a component of the climate justice that we were talking about, having a, a seat at the table. Of course, the seat is there because, I mean, I understand this is not the first time COP is in, is in Africa, but still, are the voices, are we loud enough to be heard? So it's, it's a whole different... Uh, Story. Well, just hypothetically, if the voices were heard, what sort of things might happen? I guess we would talk a little bit more about uh, the resources in Africa that are being uh, uh, mined, for example, and, and overly, overly, extremely, I mean, the continent being depleted of most of its resources for the benefit of, yes, of course, I, I, own, I own an iPhone, so I'm pretty sure I'm also guilty of that. But for the benefit of those who consume the, the, the product, I'm talking about uh, the conflict that, that rose from excessive exploitation of resources and the fact that we have areas in Congo that have not seen peace for I don't remember how long. And it's not because people like to fight. I can assure you if there was a, I don't know, maybe if I had a ma magic wand, my friend, the word would be a little bit different. I'm going to get to that. I'm going to give you a magic wand at the end of this conversation. <laughs> Is there any discussion with John Kerry or in your climate work that the world's plans to decouple economic growth from energy use will recouple 
our growth with material use because of all the mining and the rare mm. earths and the metals and things like that, many of which are found in Africa. So in some ways, the renewable energy transition is a bigger environmental burden on on Africa uh, and South America, etc. Is that something that people talk about or not? Yes and no. I mean, I think the elite among ourselves, yes, definitely we are we are debating it. But when you come to uh, governments in plural, there's that debate that says, okay, we are barely getting into, into, into the same level of development as the global north, for example. So what exactly are you trying to say? Are you trying to halt and reduce and, and, and slow us down as we, we get developed and get you know better infrastructure, resources, uh, access to, to better resources and uh, basic social services and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, better health system, better education system. What exactly are you trying? Are you trying to hamper our development now that you're bringing up, you are the one, as in global north, you are the one who who went on those years and decades and centuries of excessive uh, uh, pollution. So, and then the compensation that comes with it, for example, I, uh, it, there was a, an element to that when the Paris Declaration was being approved and, and ratified. Unfortunately, that discussion hasn't reached at government level yet. You see, we st it still remains among elites, among, among the rest of us who, si who have that debate, says, okay, what would that mean for Africa now? So what is the general attitude towards the United States and the global north? And I'll ask that in a two-part question. Amongst your colleagues, your professional colleagues that are working on these issues and amongst the general population in Uganda, Kenya, etc.? Your previous administration, we were a little bit scared. This one, we are. Happy you guys got your sense back together. So that's no, that's the. the you, you may be in for a yo-yo in the coming decade, <laughs> but but go on. It's scary. It is really, really, really extremes always scares me, my friend. Do do the extremes exist in your own political situation there uh, in a similar way? Definitely. I mean, we. we uh, uh, Somalia, for example, have been facing Al Shabaab for quite some time. Before that, it was some warlords. Uh, uh, after the collapse, that's another collapse. The co a whole country collapsed back in the nineties. So yes, extremes. Uh, yeah, they always scary. So that's that. But that's. I think we we tend to get under government of Somalia, to their credit, is tending to to get it under control right now, uh, with the help of uh, uh, the contingents from from the region, Kenya, Ethiopia, I think even Djibouti. So yeah, uh, through through AMISOM and UNSOM. But to, to answer your question, among elites, yes, we ask ourselves, why would you want to slow the, the development? And is there some an equitable way whereby we could allow a certain level of development without, of course, going all crazy and, and destroying the environment? And and then a little bit of uh, economic uh, compensation from the years and decades and of, of over exploitation, for example. And then the common person in Africa, mostly they they are very benevolent, they're very very uh, a, a really good opinion of of the United States on all aspects. What about China? Because China is really with their uh, um, Belt and Road Initiative, really trying to make a presence in Africa, probably because of access to these minerals and materials. Is it, is there a growing respect for China or is it a different sort of dynamic or? It's a complete different dynamic at that point. For China, there is, uh, we've noticed the, the level of respect we'd have uh, between between the U.S. government and, and the other government, although there is lectures on on, on human rights and etc. I mean, we understand that that's the rules of the game, and and although China does not does not infer in, in interfere in uh, in the way government conduct their uh, their businesses, but it's still a risk, and it's it's a it's a gamble. I, uh, honestly, I'm very happy to be in that place, and I'm and, and I'm really happy that I'm not. A government in Africa, or in a government in Africa, at this point, because it's a, it's a very, it's a very, you, you know, you find yourself in a very delicate situation whereby you you try to bring your country to prosper and and economically prosper and and develop, and the countries in the north do not provide the same type of uh, of arrangement that you'd get from from China. But of course, there's it's it is also a, a catch in that in that in that uh, it's it is too good to be true, to be honest. So you'll see countries that have uh, 
almost put some some of the infrastructure in into in, on on the balance with China as as they get more loans. So it is scary when we read about it as a common person and we see okay, are they going to seize my airport or uh, or my port? What the, what would that mean for my country? And as an individual, I mean, we have that pride and says, but this is what will that mean for for me as a Ugandan if 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 tomorrow they come in and seize Entebbe Airport, for example. Can they even do that? So this it is it's uh, the geopolitics that you're talking about, and the fact that probably we need to be a little bit more aware as a citizen of of what would that mean and get get that literacy. When we spent time together in August, you mentioned at our conference more than once. You mentioned that not everyone can afford collapse. Can you unpack w- what you meant by that? Oh, that was a heavy statement, my friend. Let me start with an example. We were doing, back in 2013, I was doing the review for, uh, remember at that time it was the MDG, the Millennium Development Goal, and there was uh, Goal 1, which was uh, below poverty, yeah? A certain level, like $1.25 or something. $1.25 per day? Yeah, exactly. Okay. That was the level of poverty, yeah? Uh, Below which somebody is, is categorized as being poor and popper, yeah? So the MDGs, before we even moved to the SDGs. So I was at that conference. It was a UN conference and we were analyzing and, and presenting. I was, I was a national expert at that point for from uh, civil society, government, uh, within with University of Djibouti. And then when we presented and says, okay, the cost of life, that $1.25 doesn't mean anything. As in the cost of life is uh, is so high, has increased so much that that, that pretty much... 100% of the population at that point would be considered poor or so, so some crazy number at that point. Uh, so when we're in the middle of that discussion, one of the experts, and I can assure you, I don't think the person was joking, said, but why don't we just raise, no, low, low, they say lower it down. Let's just lower it down or just play with the with the threshold as if that is a solution to, to to the poverty problem and the numbers. Let's get a better report by just, you know, just playing around the figure. And that tells me that uh, when we're talking about, about collapse, we're talking about people and population that really live with less than a dollar per day. People can afford meat, for example. Nowadays, we're talking about the global crisis, the, the price of meat in some areas in, in, in Africa are, have skyrocketed. There's a growing uh, veganism in, in in global north. We joke among ourselves. We were vegan before before the rest of the world because I mean some people really can't afford it. So yeah, that's that's what I meant by people can't afford collapse. It's true. They are they are already struggling on a daily basis to afford a meal, and that's one. We're talking about one meal a day. Some people, you know, they go to work with empty empty stomach. Kids in school, and that's that's one of the things that I really credited some of the government in Africa is is to set up those canteens, the school canteens, kids that live home empty stomach so that they and then they come to school and get breakfast at school before they get to start the the day same at, at get the dinner carry some small dinner home so that at least the parents get something to eat so you could imagine that there was a, a, a testimony about a, a nursing mother she was so weak she couldn't afford the milk for as in her body couldn't couldn't produce milk for and she's still nursing and the situation that i see and i read about almost on a daily basis. Yeah. The collapse that we're talking about, my friend. So how are these topics? Well, probably not collapse, but just the general economic trajectory, climate change, the environment, some of the issues that you and I discuss, how are they uh, covered in schools in East Africa? And what do you think is working and what still needs to be changed uh, with respect to education? I think some have moved farther, farther and faster than other countries. Yeah, I remember there was uh, well, she passed away. I think she used to, she was a, a peace, Nobel Prize Wangari Maathai professor, some a Kenyan. She was one of those local leader and and university leader, civil society leader who pushed and and promoted that education, the the leadership through education, understanding what the environment is and, and teaching how and and how to, actually how to cohabit and to live with uh, the non-human at this point protect the nature plant trees uh, rehabilitate the environment and include those curricula and, and at, at a very early age even at primary school so she is actually uh, 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 for Kenya a pioneer in that in that sense there are many other many different type of uh, area of, of, of the continent that are also uh, acting at that same level but you see as I said it's not generalized at this point. But they in in the United States at least 
high school age students are learning quite a bit about climate change. Is that the same in Africa or not in the schools? It could be. Sometimes it is included in the geography courses, uh, as in understanding what the climate is, understanding the different type of uh, of climate, and and within then, I'm sure that's where we 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 studied the various declarations, Rio, and all those uh, UN conferences, the UNFCCC, all the the convention that came through the negotiation processes. So yes, it is. But there is a contextual aspect to it that is not uh, taught. Yet, it still remains at the very general uh, um, level where we have, yeah, convention trying to understand have you ratified? What would that mean? Don't litter, for example. There, you know, some good practices that maybe you will learn in an environmental club that I really hope and wish that they were more developed at this point. So, in our first conversation this summer, I learned quite a bit in addition to where the Horn of Africa is. I was surprised to learn that there is an environmental ethic in Islam that's stated in the Quran. And you explained that to me. Could you uh, explain that to our listeners? I was totally unaware of, of that. Oh, yes. It's true. It actually, uh, we are told as Muslim that we are part and parcel of the nature. We don't own it. We did not create it. So we have to be much like the rest of the non-human. We were created by the creator. Uh, and as such, the, it, it comes with duties and responsibilities to the environment. One of it is to respect the the non-human, the nature, the trees. I say, I'm almost speaking French, les arbres. The trees, the, the insects, the being merciful to animals. Uh, you can use a donkey, but you can't beat a donkey. And, you know, those type of animal uh, uh, welfare. To a point where, of course, we have uh, three big events uh, in a year, which is uh, the Eid after Ramadan, the pil- pilgrimage, and the Eid after pilgrimage. The one after pilgrimage, you know, we sacrifice uh, a sheep or goat. And then we were told, for example, be merciful. Even in, in that where you are to, to sacrifice that, make sure that the animal doesn't see the knife and you don't, you know, move it around and say, oh, I'm going to cut your throat. Or something. I mean, be, because you have to take into consideration the feelings of the animals. And that's something that we are taught as part of our religion. It is, it doesn't get, it is true. I agree with you, Nate. It doesn't get publicized as much as the extreme gets uh, publicized. But yeah, that's that's the part of our religion that I'm really proud of. Well, the extreme gets publicized generally in in our mm-hmm. culture. And of course, the modern algorithms in the media are giving an even larger voice to the extreme. And as we discussed, there are extremes in your religion and country, and there are extremes in my country uh, and the religions here as well. And that's why when I travel, which I don't do much, and I meet people like you, I feel like a citizen of the world and I have a friend in another country that likes soup and music and laughter and animals and family and all these things that we share. And yet above us are these country boundaries and these rules of who gets what and who says what and these financial uh, markers that dictate, uh, give us a really narrow path for what we do with our life hours. So I'm very happy to hear that um, Islam has some environmental ethic embedded in its its teachings. Yeah, I'm just not a, a scholar and, and an expert in it, but I, I assure you, there's a there's a huge aspect of the non-human that has been is in the Quran that God has 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 brought on us. There's a, a whole chapter on the ants and another chapter on the bees and how a bee is important. I mean, in the Quran, in the Quran, yes. Wow, I mean, that is what I deeply care about: is the animals and insects and birds and ecosystems of this planet. And I've concluded that we have to keep the human system together from breaking apart because a true collapse would be one of the worst scenarios for the environment. Already, Mm -hmm. I imagine that if meat is scarce in Eastern Africa, that the bushmeat trade is probably accelerating. Yes. Yes. You see, there's a case of Ebola in Uganda. Ebola has been declared as a, was it epidemic in Uganda? That was a few a couple of hours ago, I can. I, I think I read that. Definitely, I don't want to uh, speculate. That's the word I was looking for. I, th- about. I thought you were going to say depress us further. <laughs> 
when the process for this. <laughs> Monkeypox for you, Ebola in this region. I, actually, let me credit the African countries because we were able to uh, to do to some extent to so, to uh, handle the COVID pandemic better than you you global north because of Ebola and and yeah. and other yeah. other epidemics and pandemics that we had we were facing. Sorry before that. So I have to credit my, we did something better than you guys. <laughs> well, you probably did other things better than us too. It you have, you true. have <laughs> vibrant communities granted at an economically materially disadvantaged uh, level, but the community presence there is much stronger than in the most places in the global North. Correct. Yes, it is true. It is true, unfortunately. And we don't discriminate. There's something that I was across many different nationalities in Africa. We were extremely saddened by how Africans were, were treated in uh, in China, in India, and in recently in Ukraine. You know, when war started in Ukraine and everybody was reaching to, and heading towards the, the border, uh, either Poland or something, there was, I mean, discrimination. It is, anyhow, unfortunately, the word that was really sad. Yeah. I just had a curiosity because I have been to Africa several times. So you split time between Uganda and you have an office in Nairobi and then you're from Djibouti. So just in your travels, just for me to uh, live vicariously through your words, what are the sort of animals that you come across in the wild animals um, when you're on your farm in Uganda, et cetera? I am so scared of animals, my friend. I don't have a farm yet. I would have probably, I would, I would probably leave leave that one. And uh, well, to we you. we talked a few weeks ago, and you were in yes. some village in Uganda. Yes, uh, it was. Uh, uh, no, I was in uh, Turkana, cross border with Uganda, uh, uh, okay. Lodwo. Yes, and it's a uh, town, and we were doing some training so for cross border communities there as part of, as part of the resilience work that we were doing. In terms of animal, I. There are two types of, uh, not two types of animal, but two, two types of spaces, geographic spaces, if I can put it that way, I'm, 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 for the lack of better words. You have, for wildlife specifically, you have the, the national parks and then you also have conservancies, yeah? And the national park, of course, they are gazetted, they're limited, so so uh, pretty much uh, fenced out, so we know it's only for, for wildlife. But in conservancies, for example, you find a mix of livestock and wildlife. And there, at times of, of scarcity, we, we are uh, the times that we are facing now, and, and sometimes back, I think back in 2018 or 2017, you have this uh, insane human livestock and wildlife interactions. When I'm talking about insane, it often results in the death of either livestock or, or, or shepherd or wildlife. I mean, uh, I recall elephant and giraffe being killed by pastoralists because because the resources were so small that that was either you protect your livestock and they get access to the to the to the resources or or it's the wildlife so these are some of the the challenges that we face in remote area where where I often work um, so here's a, an honest story from someone living in a rich country I deeply care about animals. Um, Africa has some of the most wonderful megafauna in the world. So when I hear about an elephant or a lion being killed because it's encroaching on a village, I, I feel empathy for the elephant or the lion mm -hmm. because I don't know the people in the village. And yet mm -hmm. a few months ago, a raccoon was killing my chickens. <laughs> And Sorry. I was obsessed with capturing it, which I did. <laughs> I didn't kill it. I drove it away uh, like 12 miles away. So that yes. raccoon had the highest carbon footprint of any raccoon uh, around. <laughs> but it's the same dynamic. It's just that yes. here raccoons are plentiful and mm -hmm. it's my yard and my chickens. So mm -hmm. I had a different reaction to in my brain. Yet when I think halfway across the world of a lion or an elephant being killed because it's encroaching, to me, the, the, the lions and the elephants represent wild nature of what mm -hmm. once existed on this planet. And I feel this urge to protect it. Yet how am my reaction to the raccoon is any different than the people in Uganda reacting to their other animals? Yeah. It's the same. Exactly. And I'm happy you understand. And in comparison, you see the raccoon, you can catch it. I, I, I can assure you if they could catch the, the elephant mm. and, and 
taking take him or her away, they would have done it. It's just a different we're talking about different scales of danger. But yeah. Yeah. So you have children, Ayan. As a mother, how is your knowledge of our global unfolding situation and your professional work influenced your parenting and the raising of your children? Wow. Well, I'm more scared now than I was before when I was uh, uh, when I didn't have the children. The reason why I'm scared is it's it's I, I have that constant question: What word am I creating for them, and what citizen am I raising? For example, you see what I mean? It's uh, Questions as in like empathy, uh, making sure that they see if they find a bee, they don't go and crush it because, and linking that to the honey that they enjoy, you know, whenever the, the throat is painful, say, oh, come here, yeah, here's your honey. Do you remember that? That bee that you saw it? Yes, that's, she is the one who is producing this nice honey. So please don't go kill her. Kill her. So this type of uh, education, it is, and I feel as a parent, we have a responsibility to raise the best citizen we can for the world and, and, and for the world to come as in, I mean, it's very scary responsibility, my friend. We didn't realize that when we were doing them, but we that it came as as they're growing and asking so many different intelligent questions at their age, saying that okay, okay, fine. That's why you don't have to you don't cut flowers because you see again that bee that you saw is going to come eat it, and the butterfly. Oh, what a beautiful butterfly! Yes, it, you can see them because there's so many different flowers and trees around you. There's another aspect that I will uh, I always carry as a, as a memory is, for example, uh, my country Djibouti. Again, there is a bit of the Red Sea that comes into or the Gulf of Aden that comes into the the city, and we had to we as 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 government of Djibouti so that we were able to build roads and infrastructure. We had to retake some of that space from the sea and and, and fill it with land. And by doing that, we lost some some fauna. We lost some beautiful uh, pink flamingo that used to come, and I remember that from as as a child going to school. I, and we can't see them really, you know. Whenever I drive through town, they're not there anymore. So this this is the things that I I keep in mind. I keep as a, vivid in my memory just to tell them that you know what they used to be, and trying to perpetuate that memory of of what you what was there before, and how how we uh, our action actually impact. As a, as a really uh, uh, deep impact on, on, on the other inhabitant of the planet. You are a natural ecologist, and I have no doubt <laughs> you will raise your children to be great citizens with wide boundary thinking. So um, I actually could keep you for hours, but I know it's uh, Friday night in Kenya and you've had a long week. So I would like to ask you uh, a few closing questions that I ask all my guests mm. and hopefully um, you're, you're okay with these. Can you tell us a story or two from your experiences? What's happened along the way of this trajectory that delighted you about the human spirit and, and fed your optimism? Yes, you know what feds my optimism is when I hear that peace prevailed in a time of scarcity. Mm. That it, I'm really hopeful that we were able to keep the loss of life at a minimum. That's the thing that always makes me happy, is that uh, it is true, resources are very scarce. It is true that uh, competition for those resources is also can also get deadly, but still, the communities and, and, and people have, have mentally grown enough to know that there is no point getting into a, a violent conflict or something like that because what's happened to your neighbor will definitely at this point happen to you. And what goes around comes around, as in, you know, karma is a reality and we I believe in it in, in, in my religion. We don't do harm to your neighbor because you, you never know what you can, uh, when you might need him or her for reality. I mean, for real. Um, so that's the thing that 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 I'm, I'm hopeful for. Some of the things that I, uh, an example is is the solidarity that I see when a community, for example, has been harshly uh, affected by drought and 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 the resources are already depleted. I'm I'm talking about not only natural resources, but now uh, economic resources, uh, and how how community come together, you know, to raise some small funds and make sure that you know so and so get the relief, the first aid, the first relief, the first the, the emergency uh, uh, response. That it's all it's always at community level. That's something that uh, that I'm really I'm happy about it. On the other side, what I'm if I can elaborate 
Nate, what saddens me is to see that at a global level, small wins at community level are not do not and can be upscaled. You see what I mean? As in, uh, of course, we see we see we see the first first aid and first response that countries in Europe, Poland and, and etc. provided to Ukraine. Now, in a more recent, uh, I, I see what happened in Martha's Vineyard, for example, where a community mobilized uh, itself to, to come in, in support to uh, the migrants that were dropped there. I see that. But at a global level, that's just small examples. I really wish there were a mechanism whereby those solidarity action could be triggered. A lesson, COVID was a, was, a, was a harsh lesson for me in terms of development programming. It showed that countries can end up, you know, being, uh, closing themselves, trying to protect yourself from, from, uh, from and, and closing the boundaries, which could also mean, you know, uh, the whole world came to a standstill uh, as in uh, when you hold resources, and we and remember we 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 moved from from uh, being uh, self sufficient to to relying on on another country and another producer for for pretty much everything. And one example that happened to me was when I needed medicine for my child. The medicine was uh, out of stock, although the medicine was produced in Kenya. The ingredient comes from Austria. And Austria is the only place that produced that ingredient. So because of COVID and, and delays in, in, in supply chain, that medicine became out of stock and they couldn't produce it in Kenya. So these are the type of things that I want us as future, uh, as citizens of this world, if we were able to to hold our government accountable, says, okay, listen, I understand you are afraid, but at least can you make sure that, you know, there is some uh, a movement of goods that are, that are possible. Ethiopian Airlines, for example, was the only airline who uh, maintained, I am sure it was not out of uh, philanthropy. There was also a little uh, economic uh, incentive for them to do that. But they quickly, quickly turned around and turned their planes into cargoes, for example. And that was really helpful. They were still flying around carrying goods. So these are the things, things that make me happy, but on the other hand, and they're also things that uh, that sadden me. You know, the the crisis in leadership that I that I see more and more across the globe. It is very scary. I see. Is it a crisis in leadership because we're electing the wrong people, or is it a crisis in leadership because we suddenly face a poly crisis and no leader has a game plan for such a complex, uh, threatening, upcoming decade? I think it's the latter. I'm sure some sort of democratic leaders are, are exist around the globe, which is a fairly a good number of, which is very good. But I truly believe it's because of the poly crisis, the nature of the scale of the events that we are facing uh, across the globe at this point. So we need to educate future leaders about how these things fit together and how there are no solutions, but there are better pathways than others on how to how to navigate this is my belief absolutely and be humble enough to understand that the north doesn't have all the solution and bring in i'm sure i'm sure across across the continent you have some eloquent better leaders than i'll ever be so who are able to to explain that if i may need one of the things that i see is that also the technology gap for example you see how and i understand why most African think that Africa is. Most American think that Africa is uh, is a country because I hope it becomes one country. That's where I, I hope we'll head. But my challenge is, for example, it's small, small things. You know, if I set up an early warning system, and uh, in the case of a flash floods, for example, and I have set up uh, an early warning system. The case of a flash floods means that the, the, the rain ha- it has not rained on you, for example, for you to be swamped and affected by the flash floods, but it has rained somewhere up there, up there, up north, uh, downstream somewhere to a point where you will be affected by those floods and you as an individual can, can be across the border. So how do I reach that person? These are the type of technology challenges that I, uh, genuine challenges that I'm facing, for example. How can we make sure that when you have uh, a crisis that happened in Chad and you have communities that are crossing and, and setting, settling up in, uh, in Sudan, Sudan has the financial mechanism 
to take care of of that that mobile population. That's just an example. And these are across two not only two countries but two regional block. Because I mean, we are aiming to become as an African Economic Commission. We are setting up the African Free Continental trade area where goods and services and people would be able to move freely. So these are, these are the things that we have embarked at continental level. But they, of course, it's, it's, it's such a long way. Uh, I, I, uh, these are the things that occupy my brains nowadays. So this podcast in many ways is using technology as a long-term flash flood, economic flash flood warning for, <laughs> for listeners. So we talked earlier about community and you just mentioned yes. that the global North doesn't have all the answers. So what community or daily practices in the Horn of Africa do you see or experience that would be helpful for Westerners um, listening to this ahead of what I refer to as the great simplification, which is a kind of an economic contraction and simplification of our lives? Do you have any observations or recommendations? Indigenous knowledge would be one because I, uh, it's something that, and, and, and you remember um, Lila, that we mm-hmm. met is the one who was uh, mentioning how, and that struck me because it's the same thing in our communities. They are rich in knowledge, indigenous knowledge in how to sustain soil, but we tend to forget that. We tend to to turn to fertilizers and industrial uh, uh, mechanism rather than green and indigenous knowledge. That's one. They have uh, an indigenous early warning system that tells them they have the community peace agreement whereby before uh, transhumance and, and, and pastoral mobility, they always send a diplomat. Uh, envoy to go and inform the other community that they are coming. Where should they settle? You know, this, th- 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 there is an elaborate customary law in uh, in the Isa uh, community that that spread across uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Djibouti, for example. Isa community, what is that? The Isa community that is spread across uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Isa is a tribe. It's a tribe, yes. Oh, okay. uh, and and Djibouti, and the Isa king sits in in Diradawa. So that's somehow the capital city for 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 the Isas. So those customary laws were there before uh, international law, before modern law. Um, solidarity is another aspect of it. We, we were mentioning, we we're talking about it, whereby you 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 could at time of peace travel, go through whole territory, and food and shelter will be provided to you at no cost. I mean, that's how welcome you would always feel uh, uh, within pastoral communities in East Africa. Yes. Yeah, that's not the case here. Not remotely. (laughs) That's actually my biggest fear. I mean, I worry about a lot of things. I think the single biggest thing I'm afraid of is Mm. the the number of entitled people that have their own story about the world that when resources Mm. become more scarce, their entitlement is going to blind them to community and sharing and peace and and learning and, and all that stuff. And maybe that impulse will be less in Africa because of um, you've been living this already on and off uh, for decades or longer. That's very true. It's true. We, uh, but, but you see, we, we also tend to, as, as a society modernized, we also tend to lose that. And what scares me the most in a modern society is, for example, if anything, God forbid, if anything were, were to happen to me on, on the road, that no one would come to my help. Hmm. You see what I mean? The solidarity part of it. Come and rescue your your. It's just an uh, 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 an anonymous person who gets. You see what I mean? That's something that uh, that I see a lot in your country. Well, I I think what you're saying is you have to, by definition, be self-reliant, where in the global north, in my country, if my car breaks down or something, I just uh, make a phone call and it's fixed with some money. No, what I mean is, for example, if my life was in jeopardy, if anything, God forbid, was, was uh, you know, assault or whatever, uh, you know, an accident by uh, God forbid, again, the level of solidarity or, or, or if I was, uh, there's some, some thugs who are trying to, to rob me, things like that, yeah? A physical assault to me as an individual. On the other hand, yes, of course, uh, if car breaks down, yeah, definitely the same thing. I always call road rescue the same thing uh, here in Nairobi. But but no, a physical assault assault is this thing that I'm uh, that I'm worried. Is if, if we become so entitled that, that what 
happens to your neighbor, you're just so insensitive and insensitized to uh, what happened to your neighbor. You just, okay, oh, whatever. Police is there. Somebody will, somebody will take care of it, you know, putting Mm. that on somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any specific recommendations for young people becoming aware of all this climate and resources and some of the issues that you work on, like teenager, college age, do you have recommendations to that age group of people listening to this program? I think I'll I'll, I'll invite them to be more aware of their surroundings, as in, you know, when... uh, be aware of your actions. There's things that are small, small, and, and I realize it's actually it's the small, small actions that, that things that you do inadvertently, for example, when, when, when you have wiped your hands and you threw a, or you finished a, a pack of chips and then you go and litter, uh, you threw it around without realizing that, you know, thinking who is going to pick it up after you, assuming that somebody will go and clean uh, after you. That's Go to the plastic, the huge extreme use of plastic. When you go to the beach, make sure that, you know, you collect your, some basic. And I think these are civic engagement that at point, uh, at the time, uh, rather, was, was being taught in Indus in civic education. That I, I realized what came, what constitute part of my environmental education is, okay, uh, make sure that you collect your waste after you, uh, you're, you're finished, you don't, litter the beach you know you be conscious of of your actions and and how small small actions will will combine and become a huge a whale who, who can't eat because of, of that a piece of plastic that you've left and it, it might it might you, the whale might not be next to you but it is true definitely you know the impact will be felt you know that uh, french is les fait papillon the the butterfly's wings that's the thing, the butterfly wings, exactly. Uh, and, and, and how we, we feel a global impact of small scale actions. That's for me what I would think. Uh, it's very hard. Yeah, I think raising consciousness, being conscious of what you're doing and the time we are alive is, is probably the, the very first recommendation. I, I agree with that. So here's another heavy question or light, depending on how you choose to answer. What do you care most about in the world, Ayan? What I care most about is uh, human life. Yeah. Life in general. I found it. There's a sanctity in life. And I don't know. I see too much suffering around. Sometimes unnecessary but i uh, of course i also believe that uh, there's a creator and there's there's a reason for everything that happens but but yeah the thing that i care most about is life human and non-human yeah if you were a benevolent dictator and there was no personal recourse to your decisions what is one thing that you would do to improve human and non-human and planetary futures I would set up some standard operating measures that are inviolable and you can't, as in, in time of crisis, this is what we should, the playbook. This is the playbook that we are going to. Oh, like a break glass in case of emergency playbook ahead of time. Yes, exactly. This is what to do. I'm working on that. (laughs) Yes, exactly. See, that's why we are friends. (laughs) That's the one. That's that's and, and actually make sure that they can't wiggle. You know, they can't. That's what I, the dictator is making sure that the dictator part of it is making sure that it is applied. As mm-hmm. in, you can't wiggle out. You can't just you know. Mm, yeah, well, I don't agree. No, that is exactly to the letter going to be applied. Mm-hmm. Is there such a thing like that being done in East Africa where there are blueprints and playbooks for a different economic environmental trajectory in the future? Or is it is it kind of on the fringe? It's on the fringe here, uh, to my knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Your previous administration, I mean, don't get me started, Nate. I swear that crisis of leadership, you had a whole book of pandemic prepared. I don't know what it looked like, but some for some, some reasons... It was thrown out of the window, but um, but that's your point, right? Is is at yeah. the moment of crisis, the best plans by technically capable people in the past are discarded for political reasons. Not only in my exactly. country, but in humans generally. Exactly. The, 
generally, yeah. absolutely, yes. So it, they exist, but they are very much at national level. For example, and that's the thinking that we're trying to that we've embarked on for the past what ten years, yes, in in the in the horn, is you act national, but you still need to think regional. As in, how would you accommodate the excess? I mean, the movement of population. For sure, you'll get. 20, 15 other million of people who are on the verge of famine and, and across the, the border, they will come to your country. How will you accommodate them? They will, uh, before it turns into a, a riot, civil crisis, and peace is, uh, is, is, is out, uh, instability uh, arises. So, yeah. Is there any discussion about overpopulation in general in in africa in the committees that you're in and such or is that a taboo topic oh no no it's not taboo at all as a matter of fact uh youth and and youth employment was uh ranked first in our driver of of conflict regional 2021 we're still doing the 2022 one but yeah in 2021 youth and youth in employment ranked top as uh, as driver of conflict and no but and, and and we are aware of that uh in the the region is predicted to have a, a strong annual demogra- demographic growth and uh, and it's it's estimated to be ranging between uh, 2.5 and 3.5 percent, and right now we we have 270 million people, and 60 percent of those inhabitants are youth. I mean, as in 30 years and below. So you know, no, we know that youth population, the the challenges and the opportunities that they bring, and uh, how well we can manage it. It's it, it is it's it's part of our planning and programming. Yeah. It's a, it's a really tough issue. And in my work, I always talk about, we have two population problems. One is we have 8 billion humans on a finite planet. And the other is we have a population of refrigerators and airplanes and cars and air conditioners, and they're both relevant to our situation. And people are, are rushing to the, where was it? Was it to Mars or to the, to the space? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, people are rushing to Mars. This has been a very uh, wonderful conversation, and I would love to have you back next year to take a deeper dive in, on some of these topics. Um, so glad to spend more time with you, and I wish you all the uh, the best with your your very important work in East Africa. Do you have any closing thoughts or comments uh, for our listeners? Well, I really appreciate. I, I'm I'm very, I'm humbled. Really, I, uh, I I don't consider that I have response to or a knowledge or or, or I mean I I'm, I'm sure you you understand what I mean. But I really appreciate. I've appreciated the conversation, and uh, the opportunity that we have to work on uh, on some of those heavy heavy questions. You know, at times what we realize, what I realize is that uh, much like you, we 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 are a time of a uh, cascading risk as it is not one or two or, but it's a combination of all of those and at different magnitudes and the challenges that each uh, are bringing to the human life and the non-human life that i mean the task is huge my friends i'm happy to have you by my side that's something that i can tell you salam hayan to be continued salam with pleasure thank you If you enjoyed or learned from this episode of The Great Simplification, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and visit thegreatsimplification.com for more information on future releases. 